Reality is a story the mind tells itself, an artificial structure conjured into being by the calcium ion exchanges of a million synaptic firings, a truth so strange it can only be lied into existence. And our minds can lie. Never doubt it. Have you ever watched or played something, and in the moment of doing so, you just know this is special, and you're already getting kind of sad that you'll never be able to experience it for the first time again? Insert Portal. From the moment I booted Portal up for the first time, something felt off. Nosferatu! Right away you're hit with such a strong sense of cold, ominous isolation. The feeling of solitude is thick. It immediately got me wondering just what the hell I got myself into. Whatever it was, I knew I was in for something great. Much like God of War, this is another renowned series I've avoided at all cost before having the chance to make a video on it. Honestly, I'm pretty lucky I haven't had anything about these games spoiled for me considering their immense popularity and all the references and memes that have spawned from them over the years. But I'm super excited to talk about the series now because Portal was not what I expected. Before I carry on though, I'd like to thank all of you who commented on my God of War video. Leave a comment to be featured in the next one, and many, many thanks to my patrons Stin, Dotman, Jesse, Brian, Angel, the Foe 3, and Papa Noob. 345. You play as Chell in the beginning of the game, waking up from your stasis bed, greeted by the voice of GLaDOS, an artificial intelligence in charge of operating this mysterious facility you find yourself in, known as the Aperture Science Computer Aided Enrichment Center. As you're released from your chamber, you venture throughout the complex, slowly learning step by step all the different puzzle aspects you'll be tackling throughout the game, with of course, the world famous Portal Gun, a device able to rip doorways in the fabric of reality, allowing you to pass through walls, seal and traverse large distances instantaneously. A simple yet simultaneously revolutionary mechanic. <laughs> now, if you were only shooting yourself from wall to wall, then yeah, that would probably get pretty tedious eventually, but it's all the ways you can experiment with the environment that makes Portal so satisfying to play. Using the gun, you're able to redirect lasers to power switches, pass crates through the wormholes to use to activate buttons. Hell, you can even manipulate your own momentum to catapult yourself across long distances when those areas are not able to open a portal directly to. Portal is some of the most gratifying gaming I've ever done. Sure, the simple portal gun mechanics are mind-bending just to begin with, but then when you're able to mess around and figure out puzzles on your own after 10 to 20 minutes of trying, ooh, the dopamine! <laughs> but don't forget, not everything here is all fun and... As you move along, puzzles become not just harder to solve, but more hazardous. You use platforms to maneuver across pits of lethal liquid. Other times, you have to evade lasers and balls of electricity. There's even these annoying little shit military androids that attack you, which you can take out by opening portals behind them, bonking them with boxes, or just manhandle them like little children. It's not just the environment itself that becomes more hostile, though. GLaDOS, while not an outright dick from the start, is never exactly the most reassuring presence in this place to begin with. The Aperture Science High Energy Pellet seen to the left of the chamber can and has caused permanent disabilities such as vaporization. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty permanent. She's also not very subtle in implying that your fate is up in the air when you're done with all these tests. When the testing is over, you will be missed. Even less comforting is the fact that for hours, all you do is move from one room to the next solving puzzles with only a faint chill air filling each room for ambience. No glimpses of the outside world, nearly no signs of any other humans anywhere throughout the whole facility. Well besides the blood, not to mention GLaDOS's cameras watching your every move. The closest thing you even get to having some sort of companion on your journey is the companion cube. While there's been plenty of instances for you to use cubes in puzzles before, unlike the others, this one is special. It's pink. <laughs> I see your game, GLaDOS, trying to demoralize Chell with the lonely realization that the closest thing she has to a friend in here is a block, but maybe there is more to this cube than we think. I might as well be a cake because I did lie a wee bit a second ago because blood isn't the only sign there were other humans once here. Don't forget the pools of piss and shit. There's also drawings frantically scrambled in little dens throughout the facility, rambling on about everything suspicious about this place. It seems whoever was back here was also camped out in these rooms for long periods of time considering things like canned beans and cartons of milk sprawled over the floor, and whoever was back here clearly had a thing for the companion. 
companion cube. What? So many drawings of it, pictures of it, ramblings about how the cube would never lie to whoever this was. Now, of course, this all sounds a little bit crazy, but there may actually be some credence to the idea that there's more to the companion cube than meets the eye, considering what GLaDOS herself says about it. The Enrichment Center reminds you that the weighted companion cube cannot speak. In the event that the weighted companion cube does speak, the Enrichment Center urges you to disregard its advice. Now, most notably scrambled on the walls is a phrase you've probably heard in the gaming community one way or another, whether you've played these games or not. The cake is a lie. Throughout the game, GLaDOS has been promising that once you get through all the tests, you'll be rewarded with cake. This is of course a lie, because after completing the final test, you're instead rewarded with a one-way trip into a giant incinerator. Luckily, thanks to the portal gun, you're able to evade certain death, but GLaDOS swears that killing you was never going to be the case. You continue to make an attempt to escape the facility, clearly in places you're not meant to see considering how rustic and worn down everything feels back here compared to the squeaky clean polish of the testing areas, and you also get a good feel for just how truly endless this facility really is. But trust me, this is only the tip of the iceberg. You finally come face to face with GLaDOS for the ultimate confrontation. Well you found me, congratulations. Was it worth it? Because despite your violent behavior, the only thing you've managed to break so far is my heart. Maybe you could settle for that and we'll just call it a day. I guess we both know that isn't going to happen. You chose this path. Now I have a surprise for you. Deploying surprise in five, four. Time out for a second. That wasn't supposed to happen. GLaDOS appears to drop some sort of core from her being. You throw the ball in an incinerator, and I hope you were paying attention to GLaDOS's voice before because it gets a lot more sinister from here. Good news. I figured out what that thing you just incinerated did. It was a morality core they installed after I flooded the enrichment center with a deadly neurotoxin to make me stop flooding the enrichment center with a deadly neurotoxin. So get comfortable while I warm up the neurotoxin emitters. So basically, that core was the one thing keeping GLaDOS... <coughs> Same. And now with it destroyed, it's time to destroy her piece by piece before she destroys you. As she promised, she deploys neurotoxin into the room and summons rocket launching turrets which you have to redirect the attacks of with the use of your portal gun. And with each hit GLaDOS takes, another core of hers goes flying and with them, another piece of her personality. The next core you destroy is the curiosity core, the part of her that was interested in studying Chell's behavior. Write that down, write that down! <laughs> The core you grill after that is GLaDOS' intelligence core, which causes the taunting she's done to become a lot more childish. That's you. That's how dumb you sound. You've been wrong about every single thing you've ever done, including this thing. And the final core you incinerate is her anger core. With that, in a blinding flash, the facility is ripped to shreds as you're lifted to the surface. Waking up surrounded by rubble in the parking lot of the Aperture facility as another robot drags you right back down into it. What follows is probably my favorite credit sequence in any game I've played. Uh, spoiler, except Portal 2. I'm not going to make you watch the whole thing, but you have to see some of this. Yep, GLaDOS singing a song, and it's just the best. There's also a line in here I'd like to quickly highlight where GLaDOS says, when I look out there, I'm glad I'm not you. She also briefly alludes to this as she's dying when she says, all I know is I'm the only thing standing between us and them. Now apparently, and this is just from the very little knowledge I've gained about the Portal universe as a whole while doing research for this video, so if this is true, I don't know if it is, Please don't spoil it for me. But apparently these lines are important because these are referencing whatever the Combine is from the Half-Life games, a series also developed by Valve, which is apparently a part of the same universe as Portal. If I knew Half-Life was part of this universe, I definitely would have played those games first. I just saw Portal and thought it looked the coolest of all the Valve games, and that's why I just jumped right into that. I know I've already said that Shadow of the Colossus is gonna be my next video after Portal, and I might have one more video I wanna squeeze in after Shadow of the Colossus, 
but definitely in the near future, I will be covering the Half-Life games because after playing these, I just absolutely have to. But for now, let's finish covering these. Let's hop into Portal 2. You once again start the game as Chell waking up in this mysterious hotel-like room, and after going back to sleep for a bit, you reawaken to your room not looking as cozy as it once did, but with a charming British man knocking at your door. You think you're sick, man? The man turns out to be no man at all, but instead another one of those personality cores like GLaDOS's named Wheatley, who intends to help you back to the outside world. Most test subjects do experience some uh, cognitive deterioration after a few months in suspension. Now you've been under for quite a lot longer, and it's not out of the question that you might have a very minor case of serious brain damage. I gotta say, it is incredibly impressive how much personality they pack into the animations of a metallic sphere. Spherical! I know, yeah, the humor in the last game was good, but this one is top notch. Do you understand what I'm saying at all? Does any of this make any sense? Just tell me, just say yes. Okay, what you're doing there is jumping. Uh, you just, you just jumped. But never mind. Portal 2 takes place an unknown amount of time after the first game. Unlike Bardock, I am no brilliant scientist, but judging by how overgrown the Aperture facility has become, I'd imagine at least a century has passed? According to the wiki though, it's been between roughly 50 and, uh, 50,000 years. That's quite a big window. And with all that considered, you're probably wondering how the hell Chell is even still alive, but we'll get to that. With how much time has passed though, it's nice to see a bit of nature. The environment isn't as cold and isolated as it once was. It helps having that quirky British ball around too. Catch me, catch me. As you move throughout the facility, you're not only reacquainted with your precious portal gun, but with an all too familiar foe as well. Uh, oh, there's a, there's a password. Okay, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just hack it. Not a problem. A, 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 um, Wait, did I do beat the job? Did I start writing these Power down? up, complete. I don't, okay, 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 listen. All right, new plan. Act natural, act natural. We've done nothing wrong. Hello! Oh, it's you. You know her? It's been a long time. How have you been? I've been really busy being dead. You know, after you murdered me. You did what? Uh... Oh no, 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 no! Oh no, 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 no! Yeah. Okay, look, we both said a lot of things that you're going to regret. But I think we can put our differences behind us. No! He's had an accent! With GLaDOS back running the show, you go right back to doing what you do best testing. If it's any consolation, you start getting some new toys to play around with here. There's these refraction cubes which can redirect lasers when placed in front of them, as well as these new catapult plates which are a lot of fun and lead to some pretty funny remarks from GLaDOS towards Shell. The aerial faith plate in here is sending a distress signal. You broke it, didn't you? There, try it now. What do you thought happened, right? I was just lying there? You thought I was done? Mm. This plate must not be calibrated to someone of your generous... Yes. I'll add a few zeros to the maximum weight. You look great, by the way. Very healthy. Speaking of which, this portion of the game has arguably the strongest dialogue in the series, as GLaDOS's passive aggressiveness is absolutely blistering at this point. Well done. Here come the test results. You are a horrible person. That's what it says. A horrible person. We weren't even testing for that. Don't let that horrible person thing discourage you. It's just a data point. If it makes you feel any better, science has now validated your birth mother's decision to abandon you on a doorstep. When you die, I'm going to laminate your skeleton and pose you in the lobby. That way future generations can learn from you how not to have your unfortunate bone structure. As you continue to plow through some more testing, Wheatley reveals himself to be alive and secretly continues to assist you in taking down GLaDOS. In the testing rooms, there's also these new bridges of light that can be redirected for walking across pits and sometimes are even used as shields against those pesky returning turrets. These bridges are made from natural light that I pump in from the surface. If you rubbed your cheek on one, it would be like standing outside with the sun shining on your face. It would also set your hair on fire, so don't actually do it. Meanwhile, GLaDOS keeps dropping hints about Chell's parents suddenly, leading to... Initiating surprise in three, two, one. I made it all up. Surprise. 
Oh, come on. If it makes you feel any better, they abandoned you at birth. So I very seriously doubt they even want to see you. Yep. This is it. The first half of the game is just completing tests while being mentally abused by GLaDOS. And she just does not let up about the no parents thing. I feel awful about that surprise. Tell you what, let's give your parents a call right now. The birth parents you are trying to reach do not love you. Please hang up. Eventually, you and Wheatley confront GLaDOS and initiate a core transfer between them, kicking GLaDOS to the curb and putting Wheatley in charge of the entire facility. But just about immediately upon being granted with this immense power, Wheatley is corrupted, suddenly turning hostile towards you, and also turning GLaDOS into a potato battery. Yes. A potato battery. GLaDOS then says she actually recognizes Wheatley, claiming he was once one of the personality spheres engineers attached to her to calm her down when she was born. What was his specific purpose? To make her stupid. The engineers tried everything to make me behave, to slow me down, but they even attached an intelligence dampening sphere on me. It clung to my brain like a tumor, generating an endless stream of no, not this thing, not this thing. It was your voice. No, you, no, you're lying, yes. you're lying. You're the tour. You're not just a regular moron. You're designed to be a moron. I am not a moron! Wheatley's then infuriated by GLaDOS calling him a moron, so he sends you hurtling miles. I'm not kidding. Literal miles below the Aperture facility. The great thing about being down here is you finally get answers to so many questions you've probably had since the beginning of the series. What exactly is this place? Who built it? Who's in charge? How long has it been around? What is its purpose? Buried beneath all the shiny new chrome aperture facility above lies the unconventional beginnings lost to time, and it all started all the way down here, way back in the 1940s. You're once again left to your solitude after GLaDOS was carried off by a crow, with the only companion you have around these parts being the remnant automated voice recordings of the aperture CEO, Cave Johnson, who was also occasionally accompanied by the voice of his secretary. Carolyn. Is that right, Carolyn? Yes, sir, Mr. Johnson. She's the backbone of this facility. Breeze the postcard, too. Sorry, fellas. She's married. To science. If you look around, you'll find that Cave Johnson purchased a giant salt mine to base his operations from, which is, of course, where we are now. How did Cave have all the money for this to begin with? Well, he actually started off his entrepreneurial career making shower curtains, with the company originally called Aperture Fixtures. It wasn't until his purchase of that massive salt mine under Upper Michigan in 1944 that Cave pivoted from making shower curtains to literally anything else you can think of under the name Aperture Science. Those of you who volunteered to be injected with praying mantis DNA, I've got some good news and some bad news. Bad news is we're postponing those tests indefinitely. Good news is we've got a much better test for you. Fighting an army of mantis men. Pick up a rifle and follow the yellow line. You'll know when the test starts. If you've cut yourself at all in the course of these tests, you might have noticed that your blood is pure gasoline. That's normal. We've been shooting you with an invisible laser that's supposed to turn blood into gasoline, so all that means is it's working. Now, while Aperture did mess around with some goofy, meaningless shit, they did make some great things as well, like the portal gun, like everything you've already seen, and of course, the newly introduced mobility gels. And this is where stuff gets really fun. First up, we have the blue repulsion gel, which is useful for bouncing off walls and across large distances. Oh, in case you got covered in that repulsion gel, here's some advice the lab boys gave me. Do not get covered in the repulsion gel. We haven't entirely nailed down what element it is yet, but I'll tell you this, it's a lively one and it does not like the human skeleton. Next up, the orange propulsion gel gives a nice speed boost. Increasingly dangerous and unconventional experiments such as these took Aperture Science from the most promising new science company in 1947 to just a decade or so later, Bankruptcy, also in part due to their competition with Black Mesa. No longer was Aperture able to recruit scientists or esteemed military members for testing. Instead, they had to resort to kidnapping hobos and offering them $60 for their services. If you're interested in an additional $60, flag down a test associate and let them know. 
You could walk out of here with 120 weighing down your bindle if you let us take you apart, put some science stuff in you, then put you back together. Good as new. By the early 80s, even kidnapping hobos wasn't financially feasible, and Aperture made employee testing mandatory. Desperate for a new successful product after years of failures, Cave Johnson purchased $70 million worth of moon rock, leading to the creation of the third and final gel, the conversion gel. The conversion gel is actually made of <laughs> is actually made of crushed up moon rocks, which miraculously makes for a perfect portal conductor. And while that in itself is really cool, I've got another fun fact for you. It killed Cave Johnson. Yes, really. As I said, the cum gel is made up of crushed moon rocks and Cave's prolonged exposure to the moon dust when conducting experiments caused severe damage to his lungs and his kidneys to fail. Furious at his own impending demise, in 1982, Cave ordered his engineers to develop an AI computer system that could store his consciousness, both for the purposes of immortality and to continue to run Aperture forever, but said that if he passed before its completion, his loyal assistant Carolyn would assume his place as the new CEO. Cave did in fact pass before its completion, which led to Carolyn being installed into the AI instead, becoming who we now know as the genetic life form and disc operating system. GLaDOS. And it was clearly not a decision she consented to. Now she'll argue, she'll say she can't, she's modest like that, but you make her. There's even some unused audio files which were most likely to be used in a scene where Carolyn protests the idea of becoming GLaDOS, which of course happens anyway. Sir, I do not want this. No, listen to me. Mr. Johnson, I don't want this. I don't want this. This could explain why GLaDOS is a homicidal bitch. It's really no surprise though to find out that GLaDOS is Carolyn. When reunited with GLaDOS and upon hearing Cave's voice, she shows a strong affection towards him, showing that deep inside her memory banks, Carolyn does still exist. The testing area is just up ahead. The quicker you get through, the quicker you'll get your 60 bucks. Good. Carolyn, are the compensation vouchers ready? Yes, yes sir, Mr. Johnson. Johnson. Boy, did I just... Who is that? What the hell is going on here? When life gives you lemons, don't make lemonade. Yeah. Make life take the lemons back. Yeah. Get mad. Yeah. I don't want your damn lemons. What am I supposed to do with these? Yeah, take the lemons. Demand to see life's manager. Yeah. Make life rue the day it thought it could give Cave Johnson lemons. Do you know who I am? I'm the man who's going to burn your house down with the lemons. Oh, I like this guy. I'm going to get my engineers to invent a combustible lemon that burns your house down. <laughs> When GLaDOS was officially activated for the first time, she immediately tried to kill every scientist in the facility. This led to the creation of the personality cores we saw her equipped with in Portal 1, neutering her violent tendencies and making it so that her sole purpose was to continue testing, just as she was originally designed to do. But knowing what we know now about the circumstances behind Carolyn becoming GLaDOS makes a whole lot of sense that she would immediately want to destroy everything and everyone around her. One day when she was once again activated, she locked down the entire facility facility and forced employees to continually test for both her amusement and to take down Black Mesa. The last known surviving employee was none other than Doug Ratman, the schizophrenic man behind all the drawings from earlier, as well as the protagonist from the comic at the very beginning of the video. The comics give context to everything leading up to the events of Portal 2. Doug's only friend left in the facility was none other than the companion cube. His condition allowed the cube to communicate with him, and its guidance actually saved him from death and Gladys' capture numerous times. Times. Oh, hail the magic! At one point, he even takes medication for his condition, cutting off communications with the cube. Mr. Ratman, I don't feel so good. And wouldn't you know it, almost gets himself killed. It looks like GLaDOS was right to fear the cube after all. Oh, hail! Anyway, he's seen once again trying to evade GLaDOS as she taunts him and belittles him for his schizophrenia in some really fucked up ways. Doug eventually finds a file of one of the other remaining test subjects, Chell, who was placed far down in the testing order because she was noted as abnormally stubborn. She never gives up. Ever. And with that, Doug moves her to the front of the line to be woken for testing next, knowing she was the one and only person who had a chance at destroying GLaDOS once and for all. Doug is also the sole reason Chell is even alive right now, as he's the one that put Chell into that cryo sleep she wakes up in at the beginning of Portal 2, which saves her life for an indefinite amount of time until she wakes up again later on. So go Doug!
You are the true hero of the Portal universe. Returning to the all too familiar parts of the facility, back to the watchful eyes of Wheatley, he's become even more insane and driven by the addiction of watching tests be done. So much so, he's done a horrible job upkeeping the facility because he's a moron. And it is now falling apart at the seams. The tests at first are really easy because Wheatley's a moron, but gradually become more dangerous and thrown together as Wheatley is desperate to scratch that testing itch. As with each passing test, it becomes less and less pleasurable to watch be solved, and soon enough he'll just want to kill us outright. Which of course brings us to... Wheatley announces he's found two robots in the facility built specifically for testing, which are actually the robots in the co-op campaign. Wheatley's attempt to kill you fails though, and you're once again on the run just like you were at the end of the last game. Rewatching some footage back, it's funny how similar Wheatley acts towards Chell here, making jokes reminiscing about the times they've had before he tried to kill her, just like GLaDOS did. Oh, just thinking back to the old times, the old days when we were friends, good old friends, not enemies, and I would say something like, come back, and he'd be like, yeah, no problem, and he'd come back. What happened to those days? You eventually reach Wheatley's lair, where he says he's watched back all the tapes of Chell killing GLaDOS and make sure to not make the same mistakes she did. Regardless, he is as ever a moron and is quite easily outsmarted, as we make use of the conversion gel to send bombs sailing over his shields, and this time instead of removing cores, we add cores to him to make him weaker. Like earlier in the game, there's a stalemate and we once again have to press a button to manually initiate the core transfer. However, Wheatley <laughs> trapped the button, sending Chell flying, but miraculously she is still alive because as we all know, she never gives up ever. As the facility crumbles, we see the moon hovering overhead. Chell makes one last desperate attempt to defeat Wheatley, firing a portal at the moon in the coolest ending to a video game I've ever seen. I can pull myself in! I can still fix this! I already fixed it. And you are not coming back. Oh no! Change your plans! Hold on to me! Tighter! Ah! When Chell reawakens, GLaDOS admits to her that Chell's actually been her best friend all along, and really grew to love and appreciate Chell, and then deletes the part of Carolyn inside her and she reverts back to her old ways. From there though, GLaDOS doesn't kill Chell, she allows her to go free, claiming it'd be a lot easier at this point to just do that than kill her considering she's a dangerous mute lunatic. You finally reach the surface, in the middle of what appears to be Far Cry 5, and GLaDOS grants you one last parting gift before you go. And, as if this ending couldn't get any better, we're treated to another song from GLaDOS. I mean, what else can I even say at this point? I think the Portal games speak for themselves. They are some of the most perfect games, like as close to as perfect games you can get as you possibly can. The gameplay is some of the most gratifying, innovative, and thought-provoking I've ever come across. The world building and characters are simple and easy to understand, yet also very complex, layered, and mystical? There's just such a sense of wonder to the whole Portal universe that's hard to put into words, but it's very much unlike anything I've ever played. And of course, the humor is absolutely top tier. Portal 2 especially is probably the funniest game I've ever played. All the ways GLaDOS passive aggressively comes at Chell, the interactions between GLaDOS and Wheatley, the dynamic between GLaDOS and Chell when you're forced to work together, every sentence that comes out of Cave Johnson's mouth is a highlight. I'm the man who's gonna fuck your house down! The fact that this 
giant door dramatically opens for like 30 seconds, only to reveal a significantly smaller door underneath? This video could be a whole nother hour long just filled with clips and scenes that made me laugh. I couldn't really find a place to squeeze this one in naturally, but it has to be included because this scene is my favorite of the whole game by far. Alright, so that last test was seriously disappointing. Apparently, being civil isn't motivating you, so let's, well, let's try her way, alright? Fatty. Adopted fatty. Fatty, fatty, no parents. What? What exactly is wrong with being adopted? What, what's wrong with being adopted? Uh, uh, well, um, lack of parents. Beloved, you are adopted and that's terrible. And what's wrong with me? Nothing, but so, well, some of my best friends actually are orphans. Oh. Portal is just wonderful, and it's not anything like I expected it would be, but it's all the better for that. So yeah, Portal is just as good as you've heard that it is. And if you haven't checked it out yet, I implore you to do so. So much space, need to see it all. <laughs> I wish I could take it all back. I honestly do. I honestly do wish I could take it all back. And not just because I'm stranded in space. I'm in space. I know you are, mate. Yeah, we're both in space. Yay. Anyway.